We'll kick off. So, hi everyone, I'm Imad Akhun, founder and CEO of Mercury. Welcome to our event. We're going to focus on managing remote teams. We have Alex, who uh, is a ninja at it. He's the co-founder and CEO of Deal, uh, the global payroll and compliance and kind of HR product funded by YC and Dreesen Horowitz and Spark. I think they had a stellar 2020 and raised like 46 million. So I guess firstly, Alex, how many people work at Deal and how many, uh, where are they? So we have about 85 people. For what it's worth, three months ago, we were 40 people. Um, but now we oh. have 85 people in about 27 different countries. Yeah, maybe give us a quick overview on like what Deal does. Uh, and you actually started this before the pandemic. So like, what did you see coming that like kind of made you think, hey, it's the time for Deal? Yeah, you know, um, I'm originally from France. <clears throat> I lived in Israel, I lived in the UK, in the US, in Spain. I I've lived in quite a few places around the world. Similarly, my co-founder, Shuo, she was born and raised in Beijing and she kind of like got out of China and paid her way through school before going back and building her first company. And, you know, both of us had the experience of me meeting amazing people throughout you know, school and, and work experiences. And um, whenever we started building our own companies, we had to figure out a way to hire them back home. <laughs> And, you know, I, when I started my first company, I remember in Israel, I, it was fully bootstrapped and Israeli developers are like almost as expensive as San Francisco based developer. I don't know if you've ever hired any of them and there was just no way I could afford them. So I started looking for amazing engineers in Eastern Europe to start kind of like bootstrapping my product and my early companies. And, um, you know, what, what we realized there is that they're as talented as the Israeli ones, you know, price comparison is crazy. Where does that gap come from, right? Uh, and that's how we kind of started the journey, me, both me and Troy in general, is like hiring people outside of our countries. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, uh, we, we got pretty lucky with this idea of enabling other people to hire over the world of deal, with Deal. And that happened, I think, end of 2018, we got into YC. Uh, so we're thinking through, you know, what should we really build? And that was something that we really cared about and we really wanted to enable. Uh, I don't know if you remember, we, we met during that time as well. Um, you know, we started at YC and, you know, the, 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 the basis of deal is very simple. There is talents everywhere. We want to make sure you can hire them, right? We want to make sure all the overheads that comes through compliance, legal, payments, invoice, everything is handled for you. And I think, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job so far. So, you know, we, we support over 1,200 companies from SMBs to, to public companies and, We've, we've enabled quite a few people, I think tens of thousands, to, to start working with amazing companies around the world. So uh, long way to go, but it's a good start. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm waiting till you become a unicorn so I can like post on my Twitter about the email that I sent you when I passed on your seed round and, you know, say how stupid I was. Give me a few months. <laughs> <laughs> a few months. Okay. Wow. I'm going to hold you to that. Uh, is it you have to be a US company to use deal, but you can have employees everywhere? Or you can be a company anywhere with employees anywhere? Yes, yeah, so you can be a company everywhere, anywhere with employees everywhere. We have companies. I mean, obviously, the US is our main market right now, about you know, 65 90% of our customers are US based, but we got customers in Canada, in Europe, in the Middle East, in APAC. We actually just signed our head of expansion in Colombia. So she, you know, she's been doing an amazing job. So honestly, we can help any company anywhere. It's just about uh, having, you know, a bank account and uh, wanting to hire people. <laughs> yeah, one thing that, there's two things that I feel like come up quite often uh, when it comes to like, how do you run a remote company? Uh, one is kind of like, how do you create serendipity? And the other one is like, how do you create like these kind of connections between people that are not just like work, but they're like more meaningful connections. Uh, have you built some processes or other things that you feel like have worked for like trying to solve both those things? So I think we have a lot to learn ourselves there. For, for what it's worth, um, I think the three culture points we look at the most during the interview process help quite a bit. Um, so, you know, if you're very driven and if you care about your teammates, you end up building great products and you care for their work and, and you know, you're conscious of them when you deliver or when you communicate. <clears throat> we, you know, growing from 10 people or, you know, 15 people at the beginning of the year to about 90 people now, um, it, it, it's, it's quite, it was quite rapid. So there's a lot of things that we want to do a lot better. Um, and there's tons of tools that help you with that. Like we, we recently added, um, that tool Donut, which I think a lot of remote teams are using and doing some one-on-ones between the team is something we wanted to fix, right? So a lot of a lot of people, they're within their own like node of the system, right? They don't communicate with the sales team, the product team as much as we want them to do. So that's one of the ways to do it. 
Um, we do, I don't know if you do all hands or often you do all hands at Mercury, but we do every other week one full all hands meeting. So one is product roadmap. We talk about everything that was built, you know, for the sales team, for the product team and go through everything, feedback questions. And the other one is just generally all hands. What's up at the company? What are we doing? Um, and usually we do a spotlight. So someone would come in and talk about, you know, something that they care about. Um, now that we've reached that many nationalities, one of the things I want to start is uh, doing a five minute presentation about where you're from and what are some of the fun things about your country. So I want to put that in place soon. But yeah, you know, there, there's no right or wrong answer. We're attempting to do uh, a Colombia retreat actually uh, towards like March, where it's got to be tested before hopefully you've been vaccinated. So that should bring us a little closer together. But I do think like, company retreats are a big thing. For people that missed it, there's this app called Donut. It's like a Slack app uh, that connects people. We use it at Mercury as well, I, I found. At least for like connecting, you know, uh, I normally interview people and then if they're not working with them on something specific, like I might not speak to them for like a few few months. So it's really nice to have like one-on-one -on -one time uh, using that app. Uh, something else we've done, which is, and now good ideas, but it's been fun. Is like we have this like internal podcast where we just have like someone hosted and someone uh, we have like some other employees that are guests, and we just talk about some random uh, topics. Yeah, that's kind of what what sorry? was the what was the topic last week? Was it like is it just in a random interview? One we did, I think the time before was like, what's the meaning of life? Uh, it's, it's like pretty we go pretty deep. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna try to answer right now, but <laughs> not that we came to a conclusion uh so yeah but it is i think it is hard like making those connections when you're remote and i think ideally we go back to like at least once a year like meeting up everyone in person to, to be fair um we have a good mix of sync and async as well uh, i think that's a topic that people love to talk about where you should go fully sync or whatever it is like we've got a really sync culture when it comes to like chit chat and random communications and just getting some of the things done uh, and i think one of the things that has been it's being changed a little bit right now, but at, until recently, we've had a lot of engineering like in Europe and then a lot of sales mechanism like in the US, for example. Uh, we kind of mess all of that up for customer support reasons and customer success reasons where we start to have engineers a little bit everywhere. But that, that helped at the beginning, building a very strong culture across the teams. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, because, they were, because they were on a similar time zone. Yeah, they were all on this. They were all like between London to Israel on the engineering side, for example. Right. So even on the product side, that, that made it a little easier. Uh, but, you know, when you start breaking time zone, then it doesn't matter anymore. You just go all out and whatever. <laughs> I guess to make that uh, async part work, uh, is there any like, specific tools you use? Or, you know, we, we always have a lot of announcements at the company, like some cool stuff that are happening. And uh, it does get a little lost in Slack. Um, so I've been looking at this tool called Threads. I haven't pulled the trigger just yet, but I find it quite interesting. Yeah. Does it's, it also post to Slack or is it just imagine your wall on Facebook where like people used to write so it's like one yeah. big wall where you can just write mess imagine like the general messages on Slack where no one else would talk about anything else, like a locked general channel. So that's how I kind of see it. So onboarding remote people, do you do anything special for like making sure people have like a good onboarding experience? Like what's your process? Um so the the process are being redefined really a little bit right now. Uh, but on the onboarding day, we usually have one person. So we have two people in different time zones that can take care of that, where we give you a full rundown of you know, the company, benefits at the company, how we do things, how we use Slack, how we, the different tools that we use. Um, and then we usually pair you with someone at the company. So you know, someone that you feel comfortable to ask any questions. Uh, ideally, not within your department, but right now it's been a little easier doing it that way. Um, and you know, basically you've got two, three weeks of ramping up, depending on the job where you are, where we try to make sure that you have on calls with all the right stakeholders and different people at the company. So you feel um, very taken care of. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know how different, I don't know if you know that, but I've actually never worked in an office. So I have no idea how different that is from a, from a non-remote first company standpoint. But you know, the idea is that regardless of where you are, we try to give you, um, you know, the same love and care that, uh, that you'd get uh, if you were next to us. I don't think it's like too different. I think the main thing we've tried to do this year, well, last year, I guess, uh, when we went fully remote is like, there's like a set of things that happen a little synchronously that just happen like organically. Like even something like culture, you you know, you and you feel it, like people helpful, like it's easier. Whereas I think we've really documented those things uh, a lot more. So 
uh, there's like way more material to read about it, whereas like previously we could have got, gotten away with not documenting it oh, as much. You, you can fully onboard on there without talking to anyone. Like everything yeah. is like documented to to the dot. Yeah, it's this is maybe a bit of a post-COVID question, but you believe in having like local kind of offices or clusters or you know space that people can still meet if they're you know if there's a few people in London, a few people in Paris or so whatever. What I tell everybody at there is um, whatever makes them happy is what we should do. So if you feel happier with a small office, uh, a WeWork or a small location, a couple of people, um, you should do it, right? And we're here to support, we're here to make that happen. Um, I won't go there uh, personally, I'm pretty happy working remotely, but you know, we, I, think, I think at the end of the day, we're hiring people with very different characters, different personalities, different methodology when it comes to work. And I don't think um, it's my place or it's our place to impose any methodology uh, when it comes to how they get their work done. Uh, but we're here to make- What about the work logistics work. of it? Like, you're like, hey, you take care of it, we'll pay for it, or are you, yeah, are you trying to centrally it. take care of it? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for that. You know, I, I think, uh, again, if they are happier there, then you know, I'll be happy to pay for it. I'm a little, yeah, I'm a big believer in like getting together with people, if they want to, of course, so I think, you know, we will, you know, post pandemic, we will have local clusters. Uh, and yeah, personally, I don't want to be working from my bedroom all the time. Like I want to, I f like two or three days a week, I want to feel the vibe of like working with people in person and like getting that kind of social interaction. I mean, I don't necessarily think it's like all about my work optimal maximization. I just think it's like more fun for me. So I assume other people are like that too. Yeah, I mean, you know, I do think it's fun. This week, uh, I'm in London right now for a couple of weeks and, you know, my um, director of product marketing is here, my head of product is here. And I mean, they definitely came over and it, there is definitely some efficiency gain when you're in person as well, right? For sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's, I think it, it all come down to the people's personality, right? If one of your teammates really, really doesn't want to be in an office, you know, it's, it's maybe- Yeah, not I think it's- I think the time for like forcing people to be in offices is finished, but I do think enough people want to be co-located at least for a few days a week that we're going to, I think we'll end up probably having like four or five, like these kind of clusters uh, after the pandemic. You have a lot of competitors like remote, omnipresent, other two he mentions. I think there's like a, at least another 10 probably that would like classify as competitors. Like, I guess, is that tricky? Like how do you kind of innovate, differentiate, uh, yeah is it mo more like incorrect perception like maybe those people aren't even in exactly your space no this is correct perception you know I'm, I'm quite biased i think um i think the model that we've built around um making independent work is something that the independent contractors work is something that's very unique to deal no one can really do it to be honest uh in any ways uh so this is something where you know we we win most of the companies i think where some of those companies come into place is when we're looking at our employee model uh, you anyway, know, I respect those companies. I think they're great. I think the guys at Remote are building some uh, some really great stuff. And honestly, I think we go head to head on that. And uh, when it comes to when it comes to product execution, um, I think we've built some some very unique technology around the financial stack. Uh, you know, we're a mix of a fintech company with a compliance layer, and, and that's very unique to us in how you know we execute payments, how we make, uh, even how we generate money ourselves. It's very unique to us and. Look, I think the strongest part about deal is that we do independent contractors so well, which whether you like it or not, will be a huge part of your workforce that we're completely unbiased towards which model you go for, right? So we do independence really well, we do employees really well, and we're here to help you make it work from a compliance standpoint. And that's where we're very unique, right? We're not biased towards one model or the others. And that's why we're willing to make some companies pay for it as well, right? We know what we're doing on the independent side and that's very unique to us. I think- So what is the, sorry to interrupt you. It seems like the main differentiator is you do independent contract as well. Why? And I, mm -hmm. Go for it. Go on. I've never answered like properly, like why should I, if I hire someone in like whatever, Brazil, why should I make them an independent contractor or an employee? Like what's, what's the employer's kind of decision-making? And that's exactly where we're the strongest, right? We're not trying to push you towards any model. Uh, we do both of them really well. So for example, in Brazil, we have our own subsidiary and however you want to decide the, the right way to pursue the relationship for you is, is what we want to help you with. So as, as long as we both agree that both models need both high level of compliance, like actually drilling into the subject, then it kind of becomes a, 
an internal question. Hey, if I want to hire that person as an independent, what do I need to do, right? Understanding the local labor laws at the country, understanding the infrastructure that they're using to issue an invoice, um, and all the different things that make someone an independent in their country needs to be understood. If you want to make them an employee, then that's a different decision, right? In that specific case, we have our own subsidiary there at Deal Brazil, we'll hire that person on your behalf, give them all the statutory benefits, taxes, everything, and obviously that'll be a lot more expensive, right? Because we take all the employment liability for you, right? We're the employer there. Internally, how you make that decision is kind of up to you, right? There's different things you want to consider. Is that person really an employee, right? Do you want to treat them as an employee? Uh, do you want to pay the, what it means to be an employee, right? In some countries, you'll have up to 50% taxes on top of the, the fees that a company like us or remote would charge, right? Um, so it's really a, an internal decision. And what we see is that most companies will have a couple of people on EOR, a couple of people on their own subsidiaries, and a decent amount of people as independents. And what really sets us apart is that deep expertise on understanding what model is the best for you and being really unbiased in terms of where you want to go, right? We're here to help you and make it work regardless of whether you think is the right decision. So on a high level, you go independent and it's cheaper for the company, but the person who is the independent contractor gets less benefits. And if you go employee, it's more expensive for the company, but the person gets like better benefits. Depends where. In Ukraine, it's much better to be an independent contractor. Uh, and the country is a lot more favorable to that. In Brazil, it's a lot better, a lot better to be an independent contractor. But the country hates it. <laughs> so they'll double down on you and they'll come and they'll find you if you do that as well after a certain amount of time. So I think the reflection you need to have there is what is the right model for you, for that specific person at the right time, right? Timing is also a big thing, right? You can start on an independent model and then move after into an employment model as well, right? So um, it's, I mean, one of the reasons why selling a product like Deal requires so many touch points is because every single use case is like very different, right? Understanding what's right for you today doesn't mean, to, doesn't mean it'll be right for you tomorrow. And the flexibility we have there is being there as a, you know, your, your, your advisor, right? Making you figure out what's right for you and how to make it work in, in whatever cases your GC or your head of people wants to take it. Um, I've noticed with Mercury, as we've gone remote, we've probably like biased a little bit towards more experience just because it's like we have the whole world's, uh, to some extent, the whole world's kind of, uh, you know, talent pool. There's more experienced people there. There's less of a risk because, you know, I feel like in person, it was a little easier to train uh, and you know, look after junior people. Uh, have you found that or do you hire a reasonable amount of like junior, let's just say sub two years experience, recent grads or recently kind of um, you know, learn people like, what do you feel, how that's worked for you? I think it depends on the department. I think on like <clears throat> on BizOps or sales, like I'm much more inclined to give someone junior a better chance on the engineering side. Um, I tend to hire more experienced people. You know, we're growing really fast, and we can't really take any chances on the on, on on the infrastructure of the of, of deal. And uh, you know, we're moving hundreds of millions of dollars now. So like, you you know, taking juniors is not the right move. <laughs> Maybe in the future, but on the you know on the biz up side, on the sales side, like those are departments where um, you know we welcome talent over experience. So uh, if you're very talented, you know, come come talk to me. What's your what are your feelings about like cost of living adjustments? Like how are you thinking about salaries and like different locations? Yeah, well, first of all, the word for me is everything but San Francisco. I think the prices there make no sense. So it never comes into my mind when it comes to like salary adjustments and all of those things. Uh, but after that, we try to benchmark it based on experience and location. Um, so based on the role, based on experience, based on the location. Obviously, you know, I think there's amazing people that want to pay people around the world the same salary, regardless of where they are. I think that's great. I think that uh, I owe it to my investor to, you know, to give a good living to my employees, but also make what's right for the company. Um, so I think, you know, the locations definitely impact how we think about places and how we think about hires. Um, what I love to do is, uh, for better or for worse, I like to ask uh, the people we interview, what, what would they like to earn, ballpark, and based on what makes them happy, give them a good offer. Um, you know, do you think it's, I mean, like it is hard to kind of think about, right? Because you've got one person in like maybe New York earning like two X something that someone's earning in, I don't know, maybe France or something like that, or 
like in a reasonable place uh and they're doing the same work or maybe the person earning less is doing better work uh like is that that doesn't feel fair right from an employee perspective they don't pay the same rent right <laughs> in in different countries sure, but the, 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 what they give to the company is the same for sure no i agree with that i, I think that's a fair point uh and that's one of the reasons i try to avoid hiring in the bay area in general uh but the truth in new york <laughs> I said New York. <laughs> the truth is, I look at it in a very pragmatic way. It's like, I want to do what's best for the company and what's best for them. And if they move to New York, I'll give them the same salary, no problem. Uh, but in the current conditions where they're like, the only, the most important thing for me is that whatever they are, they're paid right and they're, pay, and they're happy with the pay that they're getting. What if someone is in a more expensive location gets the highest salary band or whatever but then moves would you readjust them no um i don't just simply because i i don't no i i don't want to take that conversation i don't think it's worth having that conversation and if that person is from there and they've given a lot to the company that's what they've negotiated that's where they are um i know it sounds unfair but to to me it's just very classic uh, when i'm hiring someone in france i love friends you should come because people when they're taking local jobs, they're getting paid, you know, in the four or five thousand, and they are great engineers. I think that's great market salary, and some amazing company have made to the upper bandwidth. You coming in and saying, you know what, I'm going to pay them a 10k salary as an engineer there. You're just wrecking the market. You're making it uncompetitive for the local companies, and I don't think that's healthy for the local, like the local ecosystem, right? You don't think that's like, I mean, it's probably already happened, but it feels like in the future there's going to be a kind of like an easy arbitrage where you like go. Go live in San Francisco. Uh, you don't hire from San Francisco or New York or wherever. Get the highest salary you can get, and then just move three months later. Like it yeah. seems like an easy arbitrage to do, right? I I probably won't hire you. <laughs> I mean, I don't. You know, I think we pretend a little bit that incentives don't matter, but like, I mean, this is a huge incentive. Like, you're you're basically saying like you'll get fifty percent higher salary if you live somewhere for three months first. So like, I, that's going to influence people. For sure. I thought, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you in principle. I just think that you know, my uh, fiduciary duty to the company is to do what's the right thing. And my fiduciary duty to my employees is to give them what makes them happy. And this is how I approach it. And I mean, look, if you, if you think about the recent hires that we've made, we definitely hired some people in the Bay Area. Uh, sorry, we definitely talked to some people in the Bay Area or even in, in Austin. And their, sal like their salary uh, requirements, which is way too high for the value that they'll bring to the company. So I actually think it's going to the company to, to the other countries just make the salary band with a bit more uh, pragmatic i mean i don't know if you've tried to hire an sdr in san francisco or in new york and try to make the payback period the cac ltv work with those type of, uh, of hires it just doesn't work right it, the company can't run um so you know that that's how i think about it i think about it from the company standpoint which is there is a reason why we think it's amazing to hire talent and give them opportunity pay them more than what they're locally earning but you gotta you know you gotta stay to some extent within market yeah i do think that over time this also like suppresses some of these like um geo yeah geos that have like this like super high salaries because i, I think it does like suppress salaries there potentially and i think that's what's going to happen right like people are gonna get like paid less in those in those regions rather than i mean some people get paid more but i think there's going to be some balance out right uh, yeah. the bearing salaries are, are are nonsense to me <laughs> yeah yeah, maybe the average will be similar, but like people lower down will get pushed up and also up higher skills up. impacts, right? If someone is just really that that talented, um, you'll make an effort, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, how do you think about employee performance, performance reviews, all of that kind of stuff? Do you use any tools that you think work well? This is quite on topic because <laughs> we're doing our employee performance reviews right now. Um, so. You know, over 70% of the company has been at the company for less than six months. So <laughs> this makes it a little easier on my side. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we're doing it internally right now. Um, all of that is actually within Notion. So we are using Notion to, mainly the way we do it is a full 360 review, um, give a template to our teammates, make them feel it, get feedback, and hopefully act on it, um, and, and vice versa. I think it's very important. So you're um, doing, sorry, so you're doing performance reviews asynchronously as well like you're not doing kind of uh, in sync. uh we'll have you so we'll give you a template you fill in whatever you want and then a uh, hiring manager and the person would review it together uh and see how we you know what we can do to be better are you tying compensation to those performance reviews yeah 
Um, we do compensation on a yearly basis, unless exceptional reason we'll do it on a six month basis. Got it. Uh, question from Jeremy. I think we touched on this a little bit. Uh, curious about your weekly cadence given your remote culture. Uh, can you go deeper into your scrums, uh, approaches, any other standing meetings you do? Uh, how, do you try to standardize across the departments or does everyone do something slightly different? Yeah, everybody does something a little different. Um, on the engineering side, I think they actually have like two stand-ups a day. So one stand-up in the morning and then another stand-up for the people on the on the North America time zone altogether. Um, you know, we, we actually ship pretty fast in general. So product engineering are quite in sync and uh, we try to deliver features on, on, a, on a weekly basis. Uh, I know it's going to give some potential to, to, uh, pimple to a couple of people. But we we actually push the product a couple of times a day <laughs> right now, uh, which is which is great for customers. They're happy. They're seeing that we move and we're fixing things. And you know, I think a good example of uh, our, our cadence is we we onboarded a, a really large enterprise customers about two weeks ago, and um, actually the sales cycle was about like 15 days. And the only thing they wanted was a Nocta integration. Uh, so we shipped the full Nocta integration in like 12 days. Um, so that should give you. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit of the cadence of the team. I, I think we've got a team of really high performers that are very passionate, so that, that helps quite a bit. Uh, and then from a de department base, I think they all have their own things. I think growth has like a weekly meeting, sales has about like two meetings a week. It's, it's completely fragmented on that front. And, you know, I trust my direct reports to run the departments the way they see fit and the way that's the most optimal for the company. Do you try sit in, sitting in on all those meetings or you leave it? It's my background noise a lot of the times. <laughs> This is a question from Andre. He says, if you've got a solo founder, Delaware C Corp, and the founder does not live in the US, would they, how would they pay themselves? Do you have those kind of situations that deal or you don't deal with that? Yeah, we deal with that quite a bit. And that is, this is not legal advice. Let me, or tax advice, let me precise that. There's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, I'm going to assume you're not a US founder because a US founder would have issues uh, doing, doing that. But um, you can start off by, so what we did at, uh, with Stro is uh, we didn't pay ourselves. We uh, expensed everything we did at the company because we, the founder, are technically the company. So from rent to food, that's the way we were, we started at the beginning. And then after that, uh, we moved into an independent model in the countries we were at. Because um, if you're not American, you can um, invoice your company for the services that you do. That's actually a best practice that's done quite a bit in Europe. Um, most, a lot of the C-levels are independent of their own company. Uh, and then eventually moving as we open the subsidiaries in you know, all, all these different countries, moving into an employment model. Um, that was kind of our path to it. You could use Dill for all of that, actually. So just shoot me a note. I'm very happy to figure it out with you. Got it. Uh, another good question. What would you say was like the biggest kind of mistakes you made in running a remote team? Oh, mistakes I do all the time. The biggest mistake... Like the uh, thing you would be like, if you look back at it, you were like, oh, next time I you know, run a company at that stage, I'll definitely not do that. Reference check. At the very beginning, I didn't do it and got burned a couple of times. Um, that one I won't do again because the wrong person can you know, take, make the worst out of an environment. Uh, so that's one of the things that I overlooked at scale uh, that you shouldn't. Uh, and the second thing is I think very early on, um, during our YC times, we were really hard and being remote, we worked around the clock and we definitely burned a couple of people very early on. And, you know, we, we fixed that right away when we, when we understood. Uh, and that mainly came from, you know, high pressure environment combined with remote where you know, people are just, they really want to ship. And then if you have that 24 hour loop where some people are in SF, some people are in, in Israel or in the, U in, in the UK, you're just working all the time and, in, you know, you got to take care of yourself a little bit. Uh, when you say reference checks, you, is that just on like kind of managers and executives, or do you do them on ICs and everyone? Uh, on everyone. Uh, I, I, it was in, the, in that specific case, it was not done on an IC, and uh, um, I'll say like re specifically in that case, removing that person increased the productivity of the team by like a hundred percent. So, uh, okay. do you just ask them to give you their references, and you? like do a call with them or something or like what's that or do you try to like dig up your own reference? I usually do that and, and unless something like unless something is weird uh where you know left the company after three months 
uh, I'd want to try to understand why they actually did that. And, and uh, maybe not directly from them, but generally I'll ask them, bring on the best references. You know, most people that have good relationship with their past employers will get you in front of the right people at those companies. Gotcha. And you just kind of do a quick phone call or something? Yeah, quick phone calls, uh, pros, cons. I mean, you know, um, did a reference check, for example, on, on our recent new head of sales, and that was the best reference I've ever heard. And uh, so far, it's like every single word has been true. So uh, it's it can also reinforce you into when you're thinking about the offer and the negotiation of the offer, really understanding how a person, for example, you know, in the case of Chris, took a company from zero to 40 million in AR, understanding the, for example, the founder's perspective on that and you know how they have actually affected the company uh, positively really helps reinforce your judgment on you know making that higher, even if it's maybe a more senior one and a more costly one for the company, for example. Gotcha. I find that references are done like right at the end, and there's such a bias to just kind of get the hire done by then. Like, do you often like do a reference and then go, oh, actually, like all of the things we've learned, the, the decision we've made should be reversed right now? So here's the thing. When we think someone is the right fit, um, for better or for worse, um, we'll have them hop on like all of those calls within two, three days. Uh, so it's not a process that takes like three weeks or a month. Like we'll, we'll make that process within a day and a half or two, right? Boom, meet Alex, meet Shua, meet Dan, meet the right, like two, three other people at the company if you want to. And that can happen in such a fast pace that uh, doing the references in parallel slash at the end doesn't... Um, doesn't hurt us too much, right? We haven't spent three weeks or one month on a specific person. I've never, I've never interviewed someone that we hired for more than like a week. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, this, this is an easy setup for you from Bruno. He's been giving such hard questions and then you give this one, Bruno. He says, deals growth was amazing last year, congrats. Why do you think it's a good time for someone to join the company this year? Look, <laughs> we, we are... <laughs> It's a huge market, right? Um, we grew like 20x in the last year in revenue on the revenue side, and it was a really hard year. But it was a it was a year that set us up for success. Um, you know, I, I hope my board is not listening to that. But uh, we, we, you know, we want to grow at least 10x this year, and if it's for them, for 3x. Uh, but we want to grow at least 10x this year, and um, and we're gonna do it. We have the right infrastructure. We have the right mechanism. We've got the right product. We've got a product that you know fits within the HR ecosystem in such a nice way that. It doesn't compete with the ADPs of the world, right? It's just an adjacent product that you just bring in next to it. Um, I mean, I'm biased, but I think we're the market leader and the better product on the market by far. <laughs> so all of those things align make me very confident that you know we should be able to 10x this year, and therefore you know 10x the value of the company too. I mean, 25x is imp super impressive. But obviously, like your scale was lower, and like you had this like freaking pandemic as a tailwind. Uh, how do you get 10x again? Like, what's the what's the magic there? You're assuming the number is low. The number is not that low. <laughs> <It's> 20... <laughs> okay, you want to tell me what it was? <laughs> it's 20x on a pretty high number. It was at least 25x smaller. So <laughs> it's, it wasn't it wasn't one to two. Let me put it that way. No, look, the, 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 the thing, the way I put it is simple. Is um, over the last quarter, where you know we grew about four times, right? We we it put a lot of the infrastructure for scale, right? From head of sales, to sales operations, to hiring our, you know, the first batch of AEs and building the right principle and the enablement for them to, to, to move. At the same time, from a marketing side, we started investing on top funnel and what works, what doesn't work, which we invest more money. So, you know, I'm, based on that, I feel pretty confident that we've built uh, the beginning of a machine where we can start putting a little more oil onto. Uh, and if, you know, if, we can execute on the budget and our thought process and where we think we can go. That's that I think we can 10 X, right. But time will tell and we'll see how we do it. And then generally, I think since you're asking why you should join, uh, we have a very caring team, we're very happy people and very driven, but more importantly, look, I, I think Mercury is in a similar way, right? I don't think you'll find that many companies that where you can grow as much and you can get as much done, right? We're still in the early stage. There's so much to do. And there's very talented people that are excited about this and you will, the exposure you're going to have at deal is, uh, I really think is going to be transforming for the next few years of your career. I mean, it has been for me. I don't know if you remember it, Matt, but I'm very freaking different in over the last year and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great to, great to see the change. Uh, you're going to have gray hair soon. Uh, no, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Cedric asked, which like I feel like you just answered that, but 
what's the story behind the mega rounds? I think the answer is growing 25%, 25x in, in a year is probably the story. Uh, you got anything interesting you want to share with that, Alex? Look, my view on fundraising is um, the right person at the right time. And obviously price matters, growth matters, but I think, I don't know if you've ever met Yasmin, but if you haven't, you really need to. Uh, I'm super happy to make that. Yeah, yeah she, she is, she's awesome. She understands our business very deeply. She's been very strong value add from before the investments as well. Actually, she brought our, she brought in our best day to date, right? He's, I think he's done over a million plus in sales this year. It's like, you know, bring him, right? That, that's exactly the type of people we want to build this, this types of company. And you know, the price was right, the timing was right. We felt like the additional capital would really, you know, give us the resources to move even faster. And uh, yeah, when someone like Yasmin knocks at your door, you, you think twice about that. <laughs> Blair asks, how much fun, non-work-related team building things do you do every month? Not enough. Say. Not enough. Um, one thing we put in place that we really like, and that was a really good initiative by some of my teammates, is after all hands every week, we have like 30 minutes of um, fun time. So, you know, they'll pick a game, whether it's like an Among Us or um, I forgot all the names, like the one where you draw and you got to guess uh, what's happening there. And that, that's actually really nice. I'll, I'll say that the time zone makes it a little annoying because the sales guys are starting their day in California. So, you know, they've got their first meetings, but it definitely is definitely bonding quite a bit. I think again, Donut helps quite a bit there. Um, we're not where we want to be on that front. And it's actually one of my goals this quarter. Um, well, you know, my three main goals this quarter are actually making a, a killer employer brand because we've got amazing people applying it there and we want to, you know, really make them understand how much we value that. And this, you know, the second one is really making the team bond more and more together. Uh, that's something that I, I, matters a lot to me. And hopefully that, that retreat, if it happens, how it happens, is going to help quite a bit with that. Uh, and the third one, I, I won't say I'll keep it a surprise. <laughs> oh, well, we're looking forward to finding out. Uh, we talked a little bit about compensation and I guess it was a little focused on salaries. Do you think about equity in a similar way? Uh, like no, whether it's like cost of living adjustments to equity or it's- No, not equity is spread out based on the role at the company. So, so an engineer and wherever we'll get the same equities. Exactly. The same equity. Yeah, exactly. I, ideally, you know, they, they can they can buy, uh, you know, they can buy, if they're from, for example, some of my teammates in Ukraine, they can buy a village out of our IPO, you know, that'd be great. Simon <laughs> <laughs> uh, asks, how do you do reference checks without any biases? Uh, do you find that, like, is there like best practices for that? Or are you just going to go with it? I like biases. That's actually, I'm looking for the bias. I want to understand why, why do you think that person is great or why do you not think, where do you think their weaknesses or their strengths are? I mean, getting more than one, I think is important, but uh, you know, uh, I actually think biases are important. They're what, they're your view and your perspective on how you live through that relationship. Yeah. I guess, I think Simon might be like removing your own biases. Like if you already have an impression of someone, like how do you kind of... Uh, my own biases? Look, no, I mean, if we get to the reference check, it means my biases are positive, right? I'm here to try to understand if there's any red flag rather than anything else. Yeah, got it. Um, let's say uh, this is kind of Jeremy's question here. Uh, let's say you do have an issue with someone, they're not performing well. Uh, like, how do you think about kind of improving the performance or firing them? Like, what's, do you have like a well thought out process for that? And I don't think it changes with remote. I think, you know, my job is to make sure people have a fair shot at their jobs and uh, understanding why they're not performing, giving them the right. I mean, this is quite literally what I'm here to do is giving them the right tools for them to do their job right. And I think the, the, the first steps is spending the time with them, understanding what are the problems, what are some of the flaws in the systems they're building and the processes that they have and how can we improve doing that over time. And what I've found is that if, um, you know, I think your people is what's the most important. So involving your time there is, is critical. And what I found is if you spend the time with the person trying to help them out, they'll either succeed or realize that, you know, there's something wrong at the core or maybe at, you know, how they're approaching the job or at a, from a culture standpoint. And you know, it usually becomes a mutual decision. Like, how do you judge, you know, if your team is motivated, enjoying themselves, like, do you have like surveys or like what's the best kind of benchmarks or things you use to like track that? Yeah, I I don't I haven't done surveys. I'm not sure I'm a big fan either, to be honest. Um, I mean, you know, 
I always ask my direct report to spend the right amount of time with their teammates, making sure that everything's in order and you know, triggering the right meetings and the right one-on-ones when it's needed. Um, I mean, I have a lot to learn there, to be honest. One of the things I'm trying to do is uh, proactively message every, you know, everyone on the team every couple of weeks um, to see how are they doing, what can we do better, is, do they have any feedback for me? And uh, Like all 80 people you will try to, like, you have like one hour set out, like go message 80 people. Uh, it's, it's, it's more like, you know, we interact, all of us quite interact quite a bit. Uh, sure. So it's just like, you know, pinging them and saying, hey, oh, how are you doing? What are you working on? What can we do better? What are some of the things? Actually, yeah, I actually really enjoy doing that. I do that pretty often. Yeah, we're running a survey right now with Lattice. I don't know if you've set up Lattice yet, but it's kind of nice. I mean, I know we're doing it fully anonymously. So I do think it like surfaces trends and interesting things. Uh, I'm generally like not a fan of like service too much, but uh, like, yeah, if you keep it like relatively simple, I think it's like a pretty good idea to, especially if you notice something like if you do the same set of questions, like every six months or something, you might notice like a trend earlier on than like you would in a purely like qualitative situation, if you know what I mean. I think so. I, I think, I mean, you know, it's easy to say, and I'm probably biased and I probably don't have the full picture, but, um, you know, we try to be being so diverse, right? Like 27 countries, lots of different personalities. We try to really push forward being very candid and very open. Um, and, you know, I am definitely biased there. I'm sure we don't do it perfectly. And, and, but I, I, I do feel like people um, feel comfortable to some extent telling us like, hey, like this is something we need to improve on. Um, and if we don't and you're watching that and you're on my team, please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well. Maybe they maybe they won't feel comfortable saying it without an anonymous survey. Uh, all right, I think I'm going to leave you with a uh, with an interesting but a question you're probably very opinionated about is like you know what's going to happen with remote work post pandemic? Obviously, massively accelerated uh, because everyone kind of switched to remote work. Uh, do you think it kind of resets to some extent where you know maybe some like cool companies like Twitter like stay remote but like you know are the majority of employers going to kind of reset to the previous model with like maybe slight improvement um i think that's a little similar to what we were talking about earlier about office no office hybrid no hybrid um i think look we started deal pre-pandemic because pre-pandemic there was already amazing companies hiring around the world right sure a little more hype sure a little more conviction from bigger companies um happened Post like during thanks to the pandemic, I don't know if you get it. Thanks for that, but whatever it is. Uh, but I think you know there, there was always companies hiring around the world that hasn't changed. Um, so I think remote work generally is here to stay. I think you'll see a hybrid model in some of the like hubs like New York, San Francisco, where you know you'll have an office just for the sake of having people open. Whether or not you know you keep it open if no one shows up is another discussion. You know that's something I can't I can't really know. And I think it's going to be at a very company company culture centric like how does your company react to all of this being open again um so i, I know there's no like it's a pretty cliche answer and there's no straight answer for that but i think people are more like you said right they're they're more forward about being okay with remote work and working from home and you'll see a hybrid model where some companies will just realize an office is a straight out west of money for them versus some companies really feel like they get to connect further in in that in location you know in place you know, one thing that I wonder about, and this maybe this is a little non-PC, but like, you know, I've only had one job in my life where I worked at Bloomberg like freaking 14 years ago. And I was a very unmotivated employee. Uh, like, I, yeah, I, I love doing startups. I'm very motivated when I'm like doing this, but like, I was not passionate about what they were doing. I was like a very small uh, cog in a very big machine kind of thing. And if I had, was remote, I know I would have been even less productive for them. Uh, just because like, you know, yeah, just, job. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a good employee. That's why, <laughs> that's why I have to have my own company. Uh, Hopefully they would, you would have realized and they would have realized earlier. Then, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time like building a remote friendly culture, but also like a very strong culture. I just wonder about like, there is a lot of companies that are like a little older, a little bit more incumbent. They're not that innovative. They don't necessarily have like that strong a culture. I just don't know. I don't know if the world is like those people can be remote and still be efficient. You know what I mean? I do think yeah. they'll get a lot less out of people. Well, I, you know, and, and then comes the discussion, right? Like, will someone with more flexibility in the same space just take over their talents, 
right? Straight out. Yeah. I think yeah, maybe those are just dying companies. I mean, like Bloomberg used to track how many hours, like, you know, they had a badge and you had to swipe in and swipe out and they were like tracking your hours. So like, yeah, how do you do that in remote kind of culture, right? You just can't, you just have to be like way more trusting of your employees. Yeah, I think you will be forced into finding a company that's a better suit for your personality, I think, you know. Yeah, I just wonder like what percentage of people are employed in places that actually enjoy working there versus like that's just the you know best job they could find and they just like work there. And I actually think, you know, we're like a little biased. We think everyone like loves their job or whatever, but I think actually like more than 50% of people don't like their job and like, uh, and yeah. I'm not sure how remote would work. If they there. don't like their job and they're talented, I'm sure they can find a place at Mercury, right? <laughs> yeah, or deal. Uh, if someone's kind of interested in continuing this conversation, learning more about Dio or like meeting you, what's like the best thing they should do? Um, I've been pretty active on Twitter. <clears throat> so you can, you can DM me at any point. You can email me at any point. It's, it's pretty simple. It's just alex at letsdeal.com. We haven't pulled the Mercury move just yet on the mercury.com, uh, but it will come eventually. Uh, but yes, you know, if you need help figuring out how to give a great experience to your team, um, if you want to work with uh, the, hopefully the best people and the best product on the market, shoot me a note. We'd, we'd love to have you. And uh, hopefully you'll be an happy customer just like a Mercury. <laughs> awesome. All right. Good seeing you, Alex. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for asking good questions. Um,